when you're in more of a web two kind of a company, there's this mentality of kind of doing everything yourself. How are you going to rule the world? Whereas I think in the web three space, there's definitely more thought around how are we going to help the whole ecosystem in the community? And where can we leverage the community as well? Vendon Parik is a software engineer turned product leader, currently leads the developer experience for MetaMask, a pioneering non-custodial wallet. In this conversation, we cover Vanden experience in being a private manager in Web2 and in Web3, his transition to Web3, and the things that helped him along the way. If you are a product manager who's thinking of transitioning to Web3, or if you're interested in the way products are built in Web2 and in Web3, then don't miss this episode. Van Den, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You have a, a long-standing career as a PM. And I think a good starting point will be, why did you decide at one point to transition from Web2 to Web3? Yeah, it's kind of been a gradual process for sure for me. I think it all started with me getting into the fintech space and mainly around this whole mission around wanting to kind of level the playing field. I think what I saw with my friends and family and just pretty much many people I met was, was that there was this dichotomy of people who understood, you know, finances and, and could kind of optimize their money and kind of get the most out of it and those who couldn't. And I felt like that wasn't fair <laughs> kind of at, at my core. So that's what I wanted to, to really change. I started working at a bank, working on new products in the personal finance space. And as part of that, I kind of convinced someone at the company to let me go to a crypto event. So that's kind of how I got my first taste. And it was like in 2013. So this is a little bit earlier, not, not all the way back to the beginning, but, but pretty early. And so, yeah, I went to this conference, kind of some parts of it blew my mind. All of the key players were there. And, but it was still very, very nascent at that time. So I think I, I came back from the event and did this long write-up for the company on like all my thoughts around it and all the interesting possibilities from there. But it was a fully regulated bank. So <laughs> as you can imagine, they were, they were a little bit hesitant to sort of take the dive at that, at that moment. So it sort of ended up on the shelf for a little while. But I definitely stayed tuned in to the industry kind of from like afar for a while. And then more recently, at kind of at the end of 2021, I started to kind of get curious again and return to wanting to get a little bit more deep and understand what was happening. There was just so much happening in the industry, so much news and buzz around it. And so I wanted to take another look, essentially. And when I did that, there was a couple of interesting projects I followed. I started to get further into like the whole background of crypto and a little bit under the hood of how everything works. And I'm an engineer, a former engineer. so. There's certain things that just kind of resonate with me, you know, at that like technical level that that I I can sometimes take get some takeaways around like, oh, this is how this could like unlock some possibilities in the future, right? And so yeah, when I returned to it, there was a lot of things that also had been kind of solved. All the things that they were talking about in 2013 were on their way to becoming like to, to having solutions for them. So things like scalability, the on-ramps and off-ramps with money, the use cases. I think when I first looked at it in 2013, it was like all about remittances, like international remittances. It's still an important use case, but I think there's a lot that's come out of it around like DeFi and other, you know, NFTs and all, all this other stuff. So, so yeah, it, it really kind of, like I started going down the rabbit hole and that's what drew me in to kind of, try to make the switch to, to the Web3 space. Interesting. Uh, from your experience so far, what would you say are the biggest differences between being a private manager in Web2 versus being a private manager in Web3? As I looked at it, it's not completely different. It's not like a every single thing is different kind of environment. Some of the core product management skills that, that people have around things like prioritization and decomposing problems and managing stakeholders even and human design human-centered design process um, those those all kind of still apply 
But one of the things that, that definitely stood out to me was that there was this very deep ethos that kind of permeates the whole <laughs> industry. It all kind of comes from like the this early cypherpunk movement that was about privacy pre- preservation. And then with Bitcoin, this whole kind of like trustless way of acting and, and transacting as well. And there's these fundamental beliefs that are are there and they go all the way from what you hear in the news to like the type of customers that that engage with these tools technologies to even the infrastructure itself like some of the technology choices they've all been designed with some of that ethos in mind um, and it's not quite perfect you know if you look around you'll see different you know, like like different solutions are on different parts of the spectrum in terms of like fully adhering to that ethos and like some that are still a little bit more like web two kind of oriented, but I think the the ethos is something that's that's pretty important. And then the other thing that that kind of hit me in one of my roles was just how the the business strategy and kind of like economics can be fundamentally different. And this is a little bit of what would also drew me to the space was that there was this I went to business school and you know you learn all some of the like fundamental ways of thinking about business strategy and product strategy. And when I looked at the crypto space, I did see that there was some potential changes to some very long held like ways of thinking about things and frameworks that would probably you know, in the long term change. And so that was something that that I, I definitely found. And it was it came up when I was working on a project where we were creating our our own platform and it had its own cryptocurrency like its own token and there's this whole there's this whole topic that that you may hear a term around it's called tokenomics <laughs> and it's, it has to do with how, how you design yeah like the incentives around a token and to me that that was very different you know there's a whole process of thinking about um, like short term versus long term adoption of of like again the near term when you only have a small group of users what are some of the incentives there and then how does that change over time and the other thing that that was kind of surprising to me was that as a product manager typically you're focused on your product within a company so one product one you know within some company and you're thinking about your strategy from that standpoint right. And then if you kind of work on it, like maybe a product suite, then you're maybe thinking of like the company level. What's what's all of the stuff that we're doing from a product standpoint? And then if you're you have if you've gone even further, then you might start thinking a little bit about, well, how are we gonna work with our different partners and like across a whole ecosystem? And with things like tokenomics, that's like it's it's like part of the process from day one. Like you have to start thinking about the entire ecosystem, at least a little bit. You can always make some changes over time, but I think the projects that do well tend to have a lot of deep thinking around the whole, the whole industry and this idea of like helping or like incentivizing all players. So, you know, with products like Uber and Airbnb, they kind of popularized this this whole idea of the two sided marketplaces. And I think with with crypto, there's more like, I guess you could call them products or platforms that that are like multi-sided. Like there's so many different players involved and, and even potentially like they even look at like what the founding team members and like the community, like those those are all integral components of, of that, that like whole tokenomics strategy. So that was something that, that seemed like pretty different to me, pretty complex too to, I mean, it's hard enough to come up with a strategy for like a two-sided marketplace. And then if you go to this other level and you're trying to bring a whole bunch of people along for the ride so they understand the strategy and, you know, the, the why of the problem and the solution, then then there's a lot involved in that. I think it'll become like a whole specialty, like that, that one part of it, I think, is going to turn into a whole area that will have people who are like specialized on. I would like to unpack uh, some of the things that yeah. we, we just said. Let's start from the ethos. That was the first element that you mentioned as a difference compared to being a PM in Web2. Right. And what is it the ethos that 
you're talking about because the vision of, of this channel of PolyWeb is uh, to provide the right education to ultimately build a better internet. So I wonder... That's you bold. Know, <laughs> that's bold. <laughs> but you got to be bold, right? Yes, absolutely. And Web3 is bold as well. So I wonder if you could share some of the differences in Athos and how that resonated even more deeply with you. Yeah, I, I mean, the first one is definitely the privacy preservation. And, I, and that's not necessarily the one that I personally, like, I'm, like, obsessed with. Uh, but it, it is, it's, like, where all this came from. Like, that, that I mentioned the cypherpunk movement. So if you follow that and you, you kind of read where everything started, it, it kind of came from this idea that, like, it, cryptography itself was at one point sort of, un, uh, like, there was a threat to even use of creep cryptography. I think it was, like, the NSA was, in the U.S. was trying to control that, essentially. And so the, the cypherpunk movement was essentially against that because they recognized that, well, if you lose that, then th there's no way for people to retain their privacy. And, and, and that was one of the clear shortcomings that we saw, you know, kind of with the, with the Web 2.0 space. And so... That I think has it's like grown in in many ways, right? So it started at that level, but I think if you look at even like the the design of our, the blockchain, right? Like you, you just have these addresses, right? And they're they're anonymous, and like you don't know who's behind them necessarily. That can be confusing to people who are new to the industry. But that's again, it kind of goes back to this whole idea of optimizing for preserving people's privacy and giving them that freedom. The other kind of part of the ethos that stands out is is this idea of like trustlessness, so not re relying on central authorities for kind of like as a source of truth, but to actually have that in a more decentralized kind of environment where no one person can gain control. And if you look at this space, there's that's a constant topic, right? Is like how decentralized it could because it's on a spectrum right you can get extremely decentralized and you can be like completely centralized and there's all kinds of variations in between and so you see a lot in the industry around projects trying to go towards decentralization i think it also one of the reasons for that too is it, there's almost a resilience to it almost like the kind of original internet right where if some portion of the network was like taken out like it could the rest could keep working right i think it's the same thing with decentralization right like if some group of people work on this project and then they like decide to switch gears and like become chefs or something and not work on it anymore like it can still keep going because you you have this like community and it, if you have decentralized like decision making and ownership of the whole thing then these projects can can continue on as well so there's something really important around like decentralization. The other thing that you touched on and that I'm extremely curious to to deep dive into is product strategy. Mm. And uh, and also what you said yeah, the fact that it's it was already difficult uh, to think about a two-sided marketplace uh, for example, right? A long-term yes. strategy for that, uh, let alone for a product that has so many outlets. So I really want to go a little bit more into the specifics of that uh, and right. if you could share like your experience and maybe some example of how you set a product strategy in Web2 compared to what you're doing right now in your current job. And then maybe you can also walk us through what you're doing right now at MetaMask, your team. How do you set your strategy there for your product? Uh, like what, what are the highlights? Uh, what are the... The things that you're doing that are different also. So what I work on is the developer experience for MetaMask. MetaMask being one of the pioneering like Web3 non-custodial wallets, which means that you, you kind of like own your own keys and assets and, and, and like no one can sort of take that away from you. But again, that was sort of like one of those ethos things. And like for developer experience, it's interesting because it's it's product management and a little bit beyond that too. So product is typically like some software, you know, product that you're you're designing right so one part of that is like our developer api there's developers who use the api to actually interact with metamask and build their decentralized apps so that they can communicate with a customer's wallet and the wallet is it was originally designed to protect the end user right so they have these like private keys 
and and like very sensitive information. And so it's very dangerous in terms of like how you interact with that. And so MetaMask is all about essentially protecting that aspect as well as like the privacy component as well, sort of like keep designing it so that it you're always consenting. Anytime you're being asked of something, you know what you're kind of getting into. Um, and then the developer side is for, yeah, the rest of the ecosystem, all the players who are building these decentralized apps and actually want to communicate with MetaMask. And then, so that's, the, the API is like your sort of more traditional product. There's a website that goes along with that, like a developer website and tools that developers can use to increase their productivity and sort of get up to speed quickly. And then there's another function, which is, you see this in other industries, but it's particularly a major component in Web3, which is developer relations. And that's really the sort of bridge between like the product and like the actual community, like all the people out there. And, and, and that the role there is to get the word out when there's new capabilities, help developers on board, produce content for the community. They can get started quickly and, uh, and then also kind of fielding questions once developers are up and running. So in terms of process, we kind of follow like a little bit more of a traditional approach where we started with a level of discovery. So from internal kind of experts and stakeholders first, then starting to go external and interviewing actual developers, understanding like what are their pain points, like understanding the whole industry and like what's what are the hot topics for them. And then using that to kind of derive some like insights around the overall space and like what their challenges are and then what is our strategy within that space. So that's kind of how it starts. And 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 from there, I think we've established our strategy. We we use time boxes too. I think that's really important in product management generally. So like I I think I came in and within like maybe it was like six weeks, I, I wanted to establish that strategy. And so we just did like a very intense, like rapid version first. And we said, look, this is our quick and dirty version, right? But it, it is useful to like have a product strategy first before you even like start making other decisions because it's it sets the context for everything else that you want to do. So we we set that pretty quickly, and then you know once you've got your strategy, then it's roadmap and kind of execution and having like a regular cycle to check in also on the roadmap that you have so that you can decide when you want to make changes and, and adjustments. How do you combine this quickness, uh, you know, producing a product strategy in six weeks uh, with what you mentioned before, you know, this balance with the more long term and thinking about uh, all these potential venues and all these potential outlets? So this is where I think it, like there could be a difference, right? Like if, if you're doing something that, that has a token, it's going to power a whole ecosystem, right? You're probably going to need a, a little bit longer of a time box to do all the analysis and like have a good first step forward. And for tokens, I mean, oftentimes there's even a community that has to actually adopt and sort of buy into the, the tokenomics. That can sort of be what helps projects get off the ground, or it could be, you know, something that kills them early if they don't they don't have something that the community really believes in or feels like it is fair. So yeah, and I think for, for us, it was like, look, we have kind of like a somewhat understood problem space. It, we have one customer that we're focused on. The end user is also like a thought, like th that was definitely like a consideration. But again, there's like, there was other people at the company who already were pretty steeped in understanding like how we, the consumer space and how do we, how do we balance that with what developers need and kind of find the right happy medium. So I, th I think one of the key things is actually like tapping into the people who like are the OGs <laughs> who've been, been there for a while and like understand the industry ins and outs and some of the fundamentals, especially if you're like me and you're somewhat new to the industry, that's like essential is kind of riding somebody's coattails. And even sometimes if you have to like take direction from people, that's okay. So that's what I think helped us accelerate that. And I think we, we set the time box kind of thoughtfully, like, okay, this is, this is not the kind of problem where we need to do a lot of like extensive analysis and meeting with multiple different party, like audiences and, and trying to synthesize everything back together. But it was something where we, we kind of knew the direction we were going to be headed in. Okay, if you can share, what was the, the problem that you were exploring or discovering? 
So mainly, what's the developer journey? Yeah, so some in in the design process, often there'll be like a some kind of user journey, right? And so we kind of took that and applied that to the space. So again, there's I think there's some like parallels, right? Like if you've done things with the human centered design process in Web two, I think a lot of that does translate in in the Web three space. And so yeah, we we essentially did a combination of looking at some information either that was in the industry on blockchain or like from some of the data that we we do have like we we know how many dapps connect to metamask so things like that are are kind of useful and then and then adding on to that into actual developer interviews to really get behind some of the data and and understand some of the reasons why the data is what it is and what some of the trends are also i think because of the privacy aspect like with with web3 like there, there's a limit to how far you can get with with the data collection. So that's like kind of one of the challenges in the space for sure. Is like how do you how do you stay data driven while still respecting the privacy? So that was something that we spent some time on, and I think we leaned heavily on like the the developer interviews to kind of get over that hump. And then yeah, essentially like synthesized all that together to draw out our user journey and identify all these like kind of moments where there's challenges and there's like some opportunity to improve it. You mentioned data and balancing being data driven with with the need for for privacy and these yes. ethos of of web3. And that to me is really interesting because like as as PM like one of the things that we get told since day one is that you need to have data to make any sort of decisions. It can't just be gut feeling. And then some PMs take a more softer approach to this and say it and says, okay, it's you know, you don't need to be data driven, you need to be data informed. Mm. Right? That, that's another yes. aspect to it. Right. But I think that mostly one of the of the things that struck me the most as a product manager in Web2 is the type of metrics also that we select. So on the one side, we have the data collection and this uh, you know, thing that is ingrained in us, you need to be data-driven or software version, at least data-informed, right? And then on the other is the metrics that you pick to measure the success of your product, and this goes back both to the ethos and to the product strategy, how you set your product strategy, because it's there that you define what does success look like for your product. Right. So <laughs> I wonder how you, and, and that to me is like really the crux of, of the matter. Like, yeah, I yeah. wonder how you balance this. I think a lot of this comes down to like sort of some of the product management fundamentals, right? So, so I'll kind of trace it back to that. One th- one trend, though, so I mentioned the privacy challenge, right, with with the Web three space. But one one thing that has helped a little bit is that I think with what transpired in the Web two space, there's been actually a lot of like regulation that's come in and like pushed many companies to adjust their practices. So things like GDPR and where I live, CCPA is like a thing in California <laughs> specifically. There, so there's been more of this emphasis on like a not like kind of anonymizing the data as much as possible. So even if you're collecting data, there's there's like a limit to how detailed you get. So lots of sensitivity around personally identifiable information. And so there are now like, I think more tools that actually support this this way of using anonymized data. And, and that really comes into play when you're having to use some off the shelf tools. I think that's one of the challenges. It's a, kind of like another slight tangent here is that the Web3 space, it doesn't just automatically come with a whole product stack. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like web okay. three oriented right <laughs> there is no like existing tool that's mature that does what your sort of like web two tools do so that's where i think it's important to like kind of pick pick the right partners that can embrace that that like web three ethos many of the vendors are interested in making the shift so it's a good idea to kind of like talk to them and make sure they're they're like on board with that and they're maybe even willing to make changes on their end to their products to accommodate you but but what we do or what we find is that it's it's really helpful to have like a little bit of some reasonable approaches right so in some places you're going to use like anonymized data but you still have data i think it's what was dangerous is in the early days i don't know if there was a whole lot of data used right to make decisions in the crypto space right it was probably just a lot of 
gut feel and, and like obvious problems that were being solved. And now I think we're at the stage where, yeah, you're, you're probably going to have to use data. And I think the, the, the players who do use data to inform the product decisions will, will you know, create better products, essentially. So that's something that we do understand, you know, at MetaMask, that is, the, the data is important, like having some kind of product feedback that can be just stuff that people send you like, hey, I was trying to use this and here's the problem that I'm facing. It could be something that you ha- get from like a Discord channel. So there's like, it's, it, data doesn't have to all be just like pure like numbers and, and, and tracking yeah. and all of that, right? But we try to use some blend of the two. So we have, you know, aggregate information about general, like what are the major like considerations, like what's being used, what's not being used, which features are yeah, getting adoption, which ones aren't, what are some of the barriers, and then we'll use some of the more qualitative or yeah, some of the qualitative studies to like understand, well, why, why is that, right? Because we're not going to be able to like could directly reach out to somebody on like email or like there's, there's no direct way to connect with your customer sometimes. And so, yeah, for that, you like sometimes we'll have to supplement with, with some like actual in-person like research as well. I'm- but I think it's, it's critical to still be data driven like don't lose that you know if if you make the transition yeah i'm curious how you set your your metrics your success metrics like how do you understand when when you are successful and has it changed in this transition to web3 the way you set your metrics and your definition of success uh, absolutely this is a great topic because i, I, I i've seen like a, a spectrum here of different levels of maturity on on setting like metrics for for like success right like how do you know whether you're making progress on your objectives or or if you're like kind of deviating from that and i think in the industry i'm in right now because it's a developer product and we are kind of we are still in the stage of like i think laying some some foundation i think there there is more of this lean towards yeah just just essentially like knowing our strategy at a higher level and kind of pursuing that strategy more from like a, like, these are the, these are the things that must be true for us to get to this destination. Right. So it's a little bit more like a logic based strategy versus just like pure metrics. That said, I think the industry needs more of the metric driven approach because I have been in other environments. Like I was at a, an e-scooter sharing company kind of in the micro mobility space. And I mean, you, like, like profitability was the biggest, you know, challenge. It's like extremely hard space. You, you literally have like these scooters out on streets in just like anyone can do anything out there, right? And crazy things happen. I, I was like definitely like exposed to all the many things that happen. We just leave an asset out. out in, in. But, you know, we, we were pretty dialed in on really understanding uh, the equation that we we're working with. Like, what is this? Like, what's the strategy? How do we turn that into some kind of equation? And then what is our strategy within that equation? And, and then who's focusing on which parts of the equation? And that's it's come up in a couple of roles. So, and I think what one of the biggest benefits there is that when you have that equation and, and everyone's kind of looking at the same picture, you're, you're all kind of like headed, headed in the same direction. And then you can also have teams focus on their part and not get overwhelmed by like the like maybe their the whole equation has many moving you know knobs to deal with right but every team member can't kind of think about all of those deeply and so if you if you create that kind of equation if you're and which which is typically like either unit economics or some like a business model essentially and from that then you kind of break it out into parts like okay this number we you know this is the number we think we can drive higher this one you know, maybe we could drive it higher, but it's going to take a huge upfront investment. So there's like these, these like major kind of trade-offs and considerations to work through on that. But I think having that equation is important. And I'm like, even in, in the space I'm in right now, like I'm, I'm kind of pushing to get more of that in place, like really understanding how each team is supporting the, the larger kind of picture. And, and I think when, it, when you think about the, the equation, it can be pretty similar to other businesses, right? Like you've got your traditional kind of like funnel of either users, developers, you know, some audience going from like, how do you acquire them? What's the cost to acquire them to onboarding? And there's, what's the conversion rate in the onboarding, right? The better you can get with with conversion on onboarding, the, the, the 
kind of more efficient your whole like acquisition funnel will be. And then of course, engagement, which is like the core, what is the core experience and how sticky is that? Are people like continuing to use it over the long term, or are they kind of falling off after like a short period? And what can we do to improve that? So yeah, I think we'll see more of that. I, I've seen a couple articles now of people talking about how the projects in this like bear market, <laughs> like at the crypto winter, are 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 bringing people in with some real like business chops that are bringing that into some of the kind of design of their systems, like tokenomics, or even in some other orgs that they have these, uh, something called decentralized autonomous organization, where you're seeing more and more metrics brought into that space as well. So that even in a distributed organization, everyone kind of like has an objective that they're like optimizing for. And it's very clear, like who's doing what and where they're focused. So yeah, I think <laughs> there's, there's, that's going to be an interesting one, I think, to see how that evolves over time. It's kind of related to this, to what you're saying right now, because this process of getting this metrics mentality and everyone going in the same direction and also knowing where everyone is going, that's also mm -hmm. helpful, right? right. But how, how do you make decisions then? Like, which type of information are you currently looking at to to decide for one direction versus another? I think the funnel for growth is, is important. You know, and you're always going to have this, this balance of like, do you focus on acquisition and like conversion upfront? Or do you focus on like just making the core product better or some combination of the two? Or do you like focus on monetization, right? So I have this engaged, you know, user base. Now, how do I actually get some value out of that, right? So... You know, I think for us, I mean, you, we're looking at the environment right now, right? We're probably not going to have this huge influx of new developers, like just diving into the system all the time. I mean, for the savvy ones, maybe, but, but I don't think it's going to be like past years. And so, you know, putting more effort into things like, okay, well, improving the core experience is probably going to be where there's more value from right now. We're not going to get immediate value from like, optimizing acquisition channels and things like that. And then also thinking about like monetization and how do you tie those together in a thoughtful way? That's kind of where we're focused, even, even with the developer audience as well. Like how do, we, how do we make the developers that are already interacting with MetaMask even more, like help them be successful with their audience, right? Like at the end of the day, if we can make them successful with their audience, then, then we'll, we know that when things turn around and there's more developers entering the system, the ecosystem, then they will kind of gravitate to, to us as well. And we'll have useful solutions for them that, that help them achieve what they want to achieve. During your experience at MetaMask and in virtue of, of the team that you're working with, which is the developer experience, you told me that you had the, the chance to work with uh, developers working uh, for popular web two companies, et cetera. What was your experience there in terms of uh, education and use cases and uh, bridging kind of this gap between web two and web three? Oh yeah. So that's a huge topic in the developer relations kind of space, especially because that's, I think that's what, where most of the new developers are coming from, right? They're, they're, they're web th uh, two developers who are trying to make the d transition. Um, so there's this whole like learning cycle that they have to go through. I think in the bull markets, you know, they just come in, <laughs> like you don't have to talk about the use cases. They'll come up with their own use cases, right? Like the industry is already generating like so many use cases all the time that it, it's like, it, you just sort of follow that. I think in, in the current environment, and this is something that you know, we're working towards is actually clarifying that more being part of the conversation, not just like having a developer website, it's like, here's all these APIs and like, you know, here's the details and how to use them, but not necessarily going up to the next level where we're describing like, what can you achieve with those APIs? Like, what are some of the common use cases? And I, one thing I'll, I'll bring up here too is, and this is, I think, something that stood out in the Web3 space for me was that I think traditionally you're you know, when you're in more of a web two kind of a company, there's this mentality of kind of doing everything yourself. Like, like we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're going to create this whole platform and like 
everything is created by you and, and you, you, how are you going to rule the world, right? Like that's kind of like <laughs> the, the, some of the mentality, right? Whereas I think in the Web3 space, there's definitely more thought around how are we going to help the whole ecosystem and the community, right? And where can we leverage the community as well? Like we can't be everywhere. We, I mean, crypto and like the Web3 space, it's, it's a global thing. <laughs> and any company that thinks that they're going to kind of like be everywhere, I think they're just going to end up doing things in a pretty inefficient way, right? Like if, if you're the ones doing everything, it's, it's going to be hard to find the right pockets of value, right? And you may spend money where there's where, where it's not fruitful. Whereas if you actually like un, unlock capabilities for a community to just to pick up on their own, then they'll find the paths and they'll, they'll, you know, yeah, like get distribution where, where it's needed and where, where there's a possibility and, and I think they can collaborate. So that's something that I think is important to think about. How, how can you plug into the whole ecosystem and su- support it? And how do you incentivize the players as well? This is very fascinating. I find it that it's true for companies, but also for, for people that work in the in the industries, especially for product managers. Yeah, I mean, some of this you could probably take back to the, the Web2 space, right? I think that, that like global thinking, it does it is often useful. It's just not what what most kind of like early product managers focus on, right? Like they're usually a little bit more narrow and it's okay to be more narrow. Whereas I think in the Web3 space, it's like, it's actually kind of hard to be like too narrow, right? Like you, you do have to think about all these other players and, and, and also again, like how are you going to collaborate with everyone? Let's flip the coin for one second and like invert a perspective. What do you think Web3 and the way product is done in Web3 should learn from Web2? One that stands out is the, the user-centered design process right like that that one is something that you again you'll see many many kind of voices around this that that are really pushing to be like this has to make it has to be intuitive we can't get to mass adoption if there's so many barriers for the average person to engage and now i think another thing that we found is like safety too right like so it's you know even if people do engage but then they're doing so in an unsafe way then that's not going to be great for the industry either and it, it, and you know that's kind of like proven itself out to be a huge risk the other thing is i think there's like and this depends on on the company what i've seen is there's some companies that they sort of start a little bit like web2 oriented and they're they're picking up the web3 aspects and then in other instances it's like they're like fully immersed in the like web3 ethos and they're trying to really make sense of you know well does this other thing apply here like or should we just reinvent everything i think the one thing to be careful of is yeah inventing the wheel for everything even when there's already a pattern in the web 2.0 space that applies like leadership and being able to communicate a mission really effectively, tying it to metrics. So it's not just like the why, but like, how are we going to get there? And then what is everyone, which part is everybody working on? I think that that's, that's going to be essential. And then the final one is like business models. I think a lot of the projects when, when you're, again, when you're in a bull run, you can just sort of get funding and figure some of the other aspects out later and and some of it was like funded by like the token offerings but i think for projects to be successful in the long run they need to have some way of kind of distributing the value so it's not about like profitability necessarily but it's like with crypto you have the token you have these tokenomics and there's value that can come in and then it has to be distributed to to everyone involved you're going to be monetizing probably in different ways like i think the the ways of monet like ads like that's i may maybe brave i think brave does something where they're kind of they have this idea of like tokenizing attention right and and then using that be the intermediary with like advertisers so so some of that might come into play but i think there's going to be some reinvention of like new ways new business models that that maybe don't exist as much at the moment one of the things that always struck me about the Web3 space is the fact that there are very few PMs, very few product managers. And, and furthermore, like when I, I don't know if that happens to you as well, but when I attend some events or I go to, I don't know, some crypto or blockchain conference or NFT conference and I say, and they ask you, hey, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a product manager. And they look at me and they're like, 
Oh, you mean a project manager? <laughs> no, <laughs> actually not. <laughs> right. So I have the impression that sometimes uh, they don't even know what a product manager is. And coming from the Web2 space where the product manager is kind of the key figures of a product development team. And it's certainly probably the one that is the most public, let's say, you know, like the spokesperson usually for a product. Why do you think there are so very few product managers uh, in, in Web3 still? And why is it not, it's not known so well as a profession? I think it's the stage of maturity of the industry, right? So, so like the, and I think, you know, even though all this has been around for a little while now, it's, again, I'm still going to use the word nascent. Like, I, I think there's still a lot of like bricks being laid down for the foundation of the industry. And I think when you're at that stage, a lot of it is about the, the, the technology, right? Like, the, like. And, and to even understand that, you have to be like pretty technical. And so many of the builders in the early, early stages, I think they were, they had to be technical. So they might have been like slightly product or business oriented, like, you know, you could put that like sort of label on them. But I think most, most of them like had to have some kind of technical chops to even navigate and speak intelligently about these things and so and like all many of the people that are that have been in the industry for a while that i work with like they they still do, do development work that said i think we are getting to the point where that's starting to change right we, like there's all this talk about the user experience right that's all about you can kind of like you know, i think design and product together kind of like crafting like the right experience and so there's definitely like a, a number of product managers that I work with at uh, MetaMask. So we have a, a decent sized product management team and, and they're recognized, right? Like they're, they're not kind of like, oh, what? Like, aren't you project manager? <laughs> like it, it's definitely different than that. And, and so I think, yeah, I think it is changing. I'm also seeing that product, certain product managers, I think are uh, like, there's a profile a little bit and and there's always been a spectrum of product manager types, right? And and different product managers can fit into different environments better than others, right? So the one in this space is definitely like, if you're a little bit more technical, I think it can definitely help you get kind of started and help you navigate the space. And it's almost like the more technical you are, it's still like the better. It depends a little bit on the product, right? Like, again, if you're working on a DAP that is all about, you know, some kind of end user experience and journey that, that's involved. And I think that's one area where, you, you know, maybe it could be slightly less technical, but there's also, there's still all these nuances, right? Like the infrastructure is not at the point yet where there's, there's no like gotchas, <laughs> you know, there's still so many gotchas around all these and they, they all tie back to like this ethos and stuff like that, that you really have to, every little issue is actually pr relatively complex to solve because there's a lot of these like tensions between different considerations, like what's good for the user experience versus what's good for security, right? It's, that's a common tension that you see in almost every like platform, right? Like when it comes to authentication and authorization, right? How do you balance those? Even with payments, like in the, again, traditional industry, there's a lot of like fraud in that industry. And so you, you have to like find these interesting solutions around how, how do you, reduce the fraud while letting the good guys through, you know, almost like without as much of a barrier. So, but I, I definitely think that we're seeing more product roles pop up and, and I think even just recognition within the industry that, that, that that's definitely a role. The other scenario I've seen is I've seen some kind of like technical people kind of learn the product management side. <laughs> so that's also a possibility, right? Like if you're kind of technical and you're in the space, you can sort of migrate in from that, that path. What do you think product managers can bring to Web3 that right now maybe it's kind of missing? Like what, like how, how can a product manager be, be useful for this company? Maybe they are listening and they wonder, but why should I hire a product manager? I have my developers, <laughs> right. I have my designers, I don't need product managers. <laughs> I mean, a, lo a lot of times it does come down to like some technical people, like not wanting to do the type of work that's involved in product management that, that is just even there in like even the Web3 space. Like it's sort of inherent, like some amount of communication and like 
transparency is going to be needed. And so that comes with some overhead and some people like that, some people don't. But I, so I, I definitely see like product roles where there's a lot of engagement with the community. Like that's something that I think most product managers, you know, let's say you're working on a mobile app, like you're usually like in the reviews, like commenting back to people, depending on the size of your, your if you have like a good customer support team, you might get help there. But oftentimes like you're steeped in that, in, in that aspect you're providing updates and like letting the your audience know when there's changes to your product so that they're they're not like confused by by new features and things like that you're promoting new features right so all of that i think is something that is still needed immensely in 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 the web3 space so i think all of the communication and i think that may be even more important in these decentralized autonomous orgs where it's very like open, right? Like, and you still need someone to kind of be the one who cares the most about a problem, right? And and is thinking about many different aspects, not just like one little pocket of, you know, effort, but like, how does this all tie together? And then, again, creating that, that clear vision and strategy for the team, and even like a roadmap, I think those are extremely valuable. And they still make engineers feel nice and cozy when, when like they have a clear roadmap, they know what they're working on for the next you know couple of weeks and they have some clear like timelines and like sort of time boxes for, for their efforts. All of that is still important. And I think it's something that may have been lacking a little bit more. So, so there's definitely more environments I think that you'll find in the Web3 space where they're just kind of like, they were just building, like just build, build, build and like not a whole lot of process around things to kind of, make sure that you're you're steering and 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 your engineering team feels like they're clear on on what what direction they're headed in and what all this work that they're they're contributing is like supporting over the long haul um so that that's still important and then a, a final thing is just again the user like user centricity <laughs> right like just having that top of mind like even the words we use, I mean, there's so many buzzwords in this space. I think there's some memes floating out there around like ways that like they would describe like Airbnb, but in like Web3 terms, right? So it's like extra like complicated with like lots of yeah unusual words. So like things like that, I think are, are those are nuances that can get, you know, passed over. And it's all about getting to, again, mass adoption, right? If we want to get to mass adoption, these have to be kind of core to how we design our products and... And I think the industry is recognizing those those benefits. And I think that's what product managers should be feel proud about is all the work that they've done, you know, designing products for customers, getting feedback and going through those like those learning cycles and making adjustments and then being like a, a great communicator, you know, with their teams, their leadership and stakeholders and communities. Like that's all still super important. Absolutely. I have one final question before wrapping up, and that's for all those product managers out there that will be watching these videos and and they're wondering, how can I transition from Web 2 to Web 3? How do I get the right education? Where do I get this kind of education? And what are the things that I should expect from, from the transition? First off, I, I would say that it's important to really believe in it, right? Like, and this is, again, something just as a product manager. Like, it's like, if you don't really believe in it, then you're not going to be able to be the best like, product manager in that space, right? So I think it's really important for people to go into, like, read up on the ethos, right? Like, like go trace some of those articles, some of the writings and the history and, and get yourself, right? And everybody has their own point of view, right? I think it's important for them to look at that and see if it jives with with what they believe in right and and whether they think it is kind of a game changer and there are i i will tell you that there are, there's lots of material around crypto and all and web3 is just it's like buzzwords and and just the ponzi schemes right and then there's the other side where, where it's like it's going to take over the world and everything will completely change right so you have to find like where do i sit on that spectrum right like what do i believe in that's the first step i, I think the the second step is i do think that making sure yeah like you feel comfortable like you're going into the right environment. Like, I think that's one important choice. The, the learning stuff, there's so much available out there. I think it's 
you can dip your toes in there and kind of pick pick up what you what what you gravitate towards but you can't learn it all some of it like i think what i've learned is like you just kind of have to drink from the fire hose like in real life right doing the job right and that's where it all becomes real around like you you actually have a specific problem that you're intensely focused on and then you kind of find all these connections oh okay this is why this is that way and oh this is the history behind this uh, you know this this part of the problem so yeah, I think that the, the, the learning part is less important in terms of like having a really structured and like doing all this work ahead of time. If you have the time, great. You know, if you're like maybe not, not working for a little while, then then maybe you, you could go off and do that. Definitely thought about that. I was like, maybe I just need six months to just like <laughs> prepare myself, right? Do and it in the end. I didn't. I didn't. I went just straight in fire hose style. But I mean, I've done that a couple of times. So I think it's it's been good so far. But the company choice, that's where I will tell you a quick story that, I mean, I went into a startup for like a tiny startup and was leading a pretty ambitious product space. And we didn't have as many resources. So, and we were geographically dispersed. So I was like, there was just so much work to just any startup, right? Like any regular startup, there's a lot of work of just establishing processes and establishing like things like analytics and all these like fundamentals that you need to even just start doing product work, right? So I was spending a lot of time there and I was stretched across time zones. And I just, I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't learning the fundamentals. And, and for some people that might be okay, they might be okay just kind of being like, well, I'm just going to focus on the surface, like the part that I can touch and feel and, and see, right? Like that's fine. And, and I'm just going to work there. But for me, I felt like, okay, this is a major shift for me. I want to be in this industry for like, 10, 10 years or more. And so it's important for me to really understand the foundations. And so I made a choice to consider an opportunity where I would actually have more of that like dedicated time. And so it's a, like MetaMask is a more mature product and it's within a, a sort of larger company as well. If you want to make the like long-term transition and if you do want to be somewhat able to navigate the technical aspects then then i think it could be good to to consider like a larger company whereas if you just want to get in and you want to like just drink from the fire hose and and you're comfortable maybe not having as much time for like the low level stuff then then you might be able to kind of just go straight to a startup or if you're maybe like already a, a pretty technical product manager then i think you could you could probably like shift and kind of learn on the fly right now would be an easy time to just kind of overlook the whole space and and write it off and say you know most of these projects you know there's there's no use case and it's you know this is still like nothing's coming for years right and i i kind of that's what i did in 2013 to some extent right i i sort of put it on the shelf for a little while and kept it arm's length and when i came back to it like so much had changed. I really felt like so far behind at that stage. And that was part of what what made me kind of feel like I either get on the train now and I'm like going for the ride with everyone else, or it's just going to be too complex for me to really catch up. And I actually think that right now, you know, one of the, the benefits with the, the crypto winter is that there is a little bit of a slowdown. And so there there is this moment to focus on building, focus on learning, kind of play a little bit of catch up when you're not completely under the gun where, you know, you, like you're in growth mode and trying to, you know, scale a million things up and hire all these people, right? So in that regard, it could be a good opportunity you know, to, to make that shift now. Like if you do want to catch the train, I think now's the time. There are still lots of projects. I think there's like an investment overhang too that's still there. There's many projects that are still kind of plowing forward and are well-funded. So yeah, don't overlook the space too much at the moment. What has been your biggest learning so far navigating this space? I think it's ethos aspects, like just how just how deep that, it literally goes into people's like being, <laughs> you know, it's, I've been amazed. And, and this is, I think, particular of, of MetaMask because of where it came from and, and how early it was in the space, like how connected to the entire community it is. You know, I think some of the decisions that to me were like kind of, I think coming in fresh was like, oh, well, yeah, you know, 
throw this analytics on the website. Like, what's the big deal, right? Those kinds of things are actually really deep questions and and like much more complicated than you would think. And they're important though. So so like, and I think what I like about it is is that there is this different approach. Even in leadership, I mean, some of the decision-making that I've experienced at MetaMask has been like a 180 from from anything I've ever seen before. And it's really all about like inclusivity. Like anytime there's a decision to be made that's going to affect you, you are included and involved. Like they, they really try to do that as as much as they can <laughs> it's not perfect but like compared to other places it's typically been like hey this is what's happening everybody <laughs> you know like a little bit more top down and and people are just comfortable that nobody questions it you know as much it's nice when someone you know makes the gesture of trying to be communicative and and, and maybe like consulting with people before decisions are made but i, I feel like here it's been it's been very refreshing to to have that. And I just see how engaged everyone is because of that. So that's been one of the the really refreshing aspects that that I've I've found, particularly at MetaMask. Yeah, it's a really amazing group of people here. Van Dam, thank you so much for for your time and for sharing your knowledge. It has been a pleasure. Likewise, the pleasure has been all mine. Yeah, thank you for having me on the on the show. It, it has been wonderful. Thank you. And for those who are listening, we'll see you at the next episode. Bye. That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It would be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode. And if you cannot wait until next week, you can watch this episode right here that relates to some of the things that we talk about in this episode. Bye.